Hello and welcome to today's lesson. I'm your hard-working but indefatigable teacher, Mr. Burton. You will need to watch this video and take notes as you go. You may need to watch certain parts of the video a few times to ensure complete understanding. This is your homework and I will check your notes tomorrow before we get started. I hope you learned something. Okay, welcome to today's lesson and this is entitled The Economic Problem and essentially it is what the study of economics is all about. We have some fundamental economic questions. What, how, for whom? The what question is about allocation the how question about production, the for whom question is about distribution. So what will we produce? So we've got scarce resources in the economy and what are we going to allocate these resources to producing? And once we've decided how to um, allocate our resources within the economy, how are we going to use our production? Are we going to use lots of humans and generate lots of employment? Or are we going to use lots of capital equipment and machines to uh, generate lots of profit? And then we have the other fundamental economic question, for whom? Who gets the goods and services that are produced within an economy? So, all economies must choose the combinations and quantities of the particular goods and services what, that they produce. Are uh, they going to spend lots of money producing guns for defence, tanks, armaments, air force planes. Are we going to produce lots of consumer goods, iPads, TVs, cars? How are we going to produce these goods? All economies must choose how to use resources that they have to produce the goods and services. Now different combinations of the factors of production can be used to produce goods and services. Like we can use lots of human labor with fewer machines or relatively more machines with less labor. And by using different skill levels of labor and by using different technologies in the production process. Who gets these goods and services? All economies are going to have to choose how goods and services are to be distributed, distributed among their population. Now some people will argue that everyone getting an equal amount of goods and services would be fair while others would argue that some people should get more than others, perhaps those that work harder, perhaps those that take risks, entrepreneurs for example. Further arguments can be made that some goods and services such as healthcare and education should be distributed more equally among the population than other goods and services such as handguns and assault rifles. Good to have education and a healthy population, not so good to have um, everybody carrying handguns and assault rifles. Now perhaps the most fundamental um, concepts that we are going to look at in economics is the concept of scarcity, how that relates to choice and how a choice results in opportunity cost. Firstly scarcity, this is the situation in which available resources or the factors of production are finite. That means they're very limited or they're limited, right? They're limited. They're not, that we don't have an endless supply of resources. And the things that businesses could possibly produce are infinite, unlimited. And there are not enough resources to produce everything that consumers need and want. So because we have scarcity, not enough resources to produce everything that everybody wants, firms have to make a choice as to what goods and services they need to produce. And when they make a choice, there's an opportunity cost. And we define opportunity cost as the next best available alternative that's foregone when making a choice. So perhaps a business is banking on um, producing wine and the opportunity cost to that is perhaps producing beer. What will the business produce? What it gives up, the next best alternative available uh, that it gives up, that is foregone, is the opportunity cost. 
Now we assume that firms devote their scarce resources, these are the factors of production, to producing the most profitable goods and services. And to do so efficiently, they will maximise their profits. And this is one of the key assumptions we make in econo economics, is that firms are trying to maximise their profits. The other side of scarcity, we have consumers, and they've also got to make a choice as to what goods and services to buy and consume. Now again, consumers don't have unlimited resources to satisfy all the needs and wants that they could possibly have, and so they must make a choice, and because they have, are making choices in the economy as well, they are also incurring an opportunity cost. If a consumer buys a bottle of wine, she may not be able to buy a bottle of beer. And the assumption that we make here is that consumers devote their scarce resources, the money they have, the time available to them to purchasing the goods and services which bring them the greatest welfare and the greatest welfare per dollar spent. So, um, a luxury car like a BMW might bring a huge amount of um, joy and happiness and utility to somebody's life, but again it's incredibly expensive. So we look at that the cost of the good per dollar, we average it out. Show me. Scarcity is the basic economic problem that arises because people have unlimited wants, but resources are limited. Because of scarcity, various economic decisions must be made to allocate resources efficiently. Some wants must be given up so that others can be achieved. The fact that choices have to be made about how to use limited resources to meet unlimited wants affects individuals, businesses, industries, governments, and even the worldwide economy. It is an important concept for the study of consumer demand and how individuals and business make consumption, production, and investment choices. At the individual level, time is an example of a scarce resource. The hours you spend working to make an income are hours that you don't spend relaxing or with your family. At the business level, money is an example of a scarce resource. The dollars spent on rent, wages, and raw materials are dollars that don't go towards profits. On the government level, land is an example of a scarce resource. With only so many square miles of usable land available, agencies from city councils to the federal government must make decisions about the best use of space. Land turned into a park is land that cannot be used for roads or houses. Ultimately, scarcity is all about compromise. In order to gain one resource, you must cut back on another. And that's it, scarcity in a nutshell, the basic economic problem. Something is scarce when it's desired but limited. Scarce resources are those things both natural and man-made that are used in the production of goods and services that humans consume to survive and to enjoy life. The problem with scarcity is that while resources are finite, the wants and needs of humans are infinite. There are simply not enough resources available in the world to satisfy the wants of the world's people. In our pursuit of our material desires, we use up more and more of the world's resources, so scarcity becomes intensified. Show me. Opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is what a person sacrifices when they choose one option over another. Tony is a sous chef at one of the best restaurants in the city. He earns a respectable salary of $50,000 a year. It's a good job, but he thinks he can do better. So he decides to start his own restaurant called Tony's Bistro. In the first year, he earns only 25% of what he made as a sous chef, or $12,500. The opportunity cost of starting his own business is the other 75% of the income that he would have made if he had stayed at his old job, or $37,500. Tony doesn't make too much for the first four years his restaurant is open, and his opportunity costs are high. He only earns $50,000 instead of the $200,000 he would have earned at his old job. So his opportunity cost is $150,000. Suddenly in year five, Tony's Bistro starts receiving rave reviews from food critics 
and earning top rankings from Zagat and Michelin. Business is booming, and he is making five times as much as he made at his old job, or $250,000 a year. He realizes that if he was still working as a sous chef, his opportunity cost would now be $200,000 a year. Although Tony sacrificed income and his opportunity cost was high in the short term, in the long run, his opportunity cost would have been higher if he had not opened his own restaurant. Okay, opportunity costs, very, very, very central concept to the study of microeconomics. Now we do face trade-offs every day of our lives. On a Friday night, you may face several trade-offs. You may want to go, you can go to a movie with friends, have dinner at home with your parents, play video games with your brother, or study for next week's exams. Trade-offs are the various opportunities you could choose to pursue in any given situation. The opportunity cost of a decision is the next best alternative to that choice you make. If you decide to play the video games on Friday night, but the next best alternative was to study, then the opportunity cost of playing video games is the benefit you would have gained from studying instead. Always choose study over video games. Needs, wants and resources. Needs versus wants. Now our needs and wants are very different. We need some things just to stay alive and these things include water, food, shelter, staying warm, but our wants are never ending so we say they're infinite. Once we've satisfied one, we move on to the next. Resources. Now in contrast to our wants, the resources used to produce these goods and services are in very limited supply. They are finite. Collectively we call the resources factors of production and these resources can be divided into four groups land, labor, capital and enterprise. So the four factors of production are resources. Land is a natural resource available for production. Now some nations are going to have a large amount of a particular natural resource and so they're able to specialize in the extraction of, and production of it. For example, North Sea Oil and Gas in Britain and Norway. Labour, we define that as being the human input into the production process. Now not all labour is of the same quality. Different people have different skills and qualifications, which we call human capital. When people have more human capital, they're likely to be more productive. And when things are classified as being more productive, that means they can produce more in the same period of time. The term capital means investment in goods that are used to produce other goods in the future. So that's an important term there. Capital means investment in goods and services that are produced goods in the future. And we term these capital goods, goods that are used to produce other goods. Now examples include machinery, plant and equipment, new technology, factories and buildings. Enterprise is the idea of having ideas and taking risks and setting up or running a business. And an entrepreneur is someone involved in taking those risks, perhaps by putting in their money, having the ideas and the drive to set up or run the business. And the reward for being an entrepreneur is profit. Factors of production. Factors of production is an economic term describing the general inputs used to produce goods and services to make a profit. Under the classical view of economics, the factors of production consist of land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Land refers to the land itself as well as the raw materials that come from the land. This includes timber, coal, precious minerals such as gold and water. It can also mean the physical area on which a factory sits. Labor refers to the workers who answer the phones, lift the pallets, drive the trucks, push the paperwork, and do all things physical and intellectual to keep a business running. Capital refers to the buildings, machines, and tools used in the process of production. Capital is anything from a fleet of delivery trucks, to a factory building, to a printing press, or a computer. Intellectual capital is defined as the technological expertise a business acquires over time, its trade secrets, and unique business processes. There is also social capital, the ability to operate because society has agreed to a system of order, conduct, and law. 
These elements facilitate an economic environment that allows the business to operate. Finally, entrepreneurship is the factor of production that ties the other three together. The entrepreneur provides innovation and creativity in the use of the other factors, which helps create a profitable business. For simplicity and analytic purposes, economists and analysts usually focus attention on two main factors, capital and labor. The relationship of both these factors and a company's output is referred to as the production function. Now, production, we have different sectors of the economy. The production of nearly all goods and services uses up scarce resources. And we have three different sectors of the economy, and these are shown below. So we have the primary, secondary, and tertiary. The primary sector of the economy, these are where the extraction of raw materials take place. And examples of these are mining, farming, fishing, forestry, oil extraction. Se the secondary sector, are these are where raw materials are manufactured into goods. Manufactured into goods, the secondary sector is quite often referred to as a manufacturing sector. And examples here are car manufacturing, furniture manufacturing, the manufacture of electronic goods such as computers and mobile phone. The tertiary or the services sector, uh, these are things that are performed for other people. And examples are banking, insurance, tourism and education. Healthcare is another big um, service sector. Differentiating between goods and services. When you grow up, there are a lot of different jobs you can do. People can pay you to fly planes, build buildings, bake cakes, or be a doctor. You can also sell things to people, such as cars, clothes, books, or even pets. The first group of things are services. The second group of things are goods. So, what is the difference between goods and services? Goods are things that you can touch, feel, and take home with you. If you buy a good, you then own it. Services are things other people do for you, which you pay them for. If you get a haircut, that is a service because you are paying the hairdresser to cut your hair. If you pay a bus driver to take you somewhere, that's also a service. You can't touch a bus ride or take it home with you. A bus ride is a service, not a good. Let's look at some more examples. Every day in Shopville, people are buying goods and services. Let's look at some of the things they buy. Your teacher will pause the video and you can guess which ones are goods and which ones are services. No, I won't. Remember, you pause it. goods are the things that you can touch, feel and take home with you. Services are things that you pay people to do for you. Okay, here we go. This is Jenkins. Today, he went to the shops and bought some clothes, some books, and got his bike fixed. Which of these are goods, and which of these are services? Why don't you pause now and figure out which one is which? Great job! Clothes and books are goods because they are things that you can take home with you. Getting your bike fix is a service, because Jenkins paid the repairman to do something for him. Now let's see what Sally is doing in Shopville today. Today, Sally went to the post office and paid for a letter to be delivered. She also had lunch at a restaurant and bought a new TV. Which of these things are goods and which are services? Why don't you see if you can work out which of those things are goods and services? Well done! Sally paid for two services today. Mailing the letter was one service, and the other service was lunch. She paid the people at the post office to mail her letter, and she paid the people at the restaurant to cook her lunch. She also bought a TV, and this is a good, because she could take it home with her. So remember, goods are things that you can touch, feel, and take home with you at the end of the day. Services are things you pay other people to do for you. Okay, so a clear distinction then between these two types of products. Goods are items that you can touch, and that means they're tangible. You can take them home and use them. An example of a good is a pen or a packet of chips. 
A service is something that someone provides for you. You can't touch it, so we say it's intangible. And examples include tourism and banking. The economic problem, we can divvy this up into four parts. The problem of allocation of resources, the problem of economic efficiency, economic growth, and the problem of full employment of resources. The problem of allocation of resources arises due to the scarcity of resources, and we've looked at that previously. And this refers to the question of which ones should be satisfied and which should be left unsatisfied, remembering we can't satisfy them all. So in other words, what to produce and how much to produce. More production of a good implies that more resources are going to be required to produce that good and we know that resources are scarce. These two facts together mean that if a society decides to increase production of some good, it has to withdraw some resources from the production of another good. Remember the concept of opportunity cost. So in other words, more production of a desired commodity, a good, can be made possible only by reducing the quantity of resources used in the production of other goods. Resources are scarce, and we know this, and it's important to use them as efficiently as possible. The, the more efficiently we use resources, the less likely we are to waste these scarce resources. So, this is essential to know the production and distribution of a national product made by an economy is maximally efficient. The production becomes more efficient only if the productive resources are used in a way that any other reallocation does not produce more of one good without reducing the output of any other goods. So what we're saying here, efficient distribution means that any redistribution of goods cannot make anyone better off without making someone else worse off. The inefficiencies of production and distribution exist in all types of economies. The welfare of the people can be increased if these inefficiencies are ruled out. The problem of full employment of resources. Scarce resources, the question of whether all available resources are being fully employed is an important one. An economy should achieve maximum satisfaction by using the scarce resources in the best possible manner. Resources should not be wasted or used inefficiently. However, in capitalist economies, market economies, the available resources are not fully employed. In times of recession, there are many people willing and wanting to work who go without employment. Unemployment, a waste of a scarce resource labour. It supposes that the scarce resources are not fully being used in a capitalist or market economy. And the problem of economic growth. If the productive capacity of the economy grows, it will be able to produce progressively more goods. The more goods are produced, will result in a rise in the standard of living of the people in their economy. The increase in productive capacity of an economy is called economic growth, and there are various factors affecting economic growth, including the allocation of resources to capital goods, which are those goods and that are used to make other goods, investment in technology and skills and education training to raise the productivity of labour. This part of the economic problem is studied in the economies of development. The economic problem. 